Okay, thanks, Cookie, for the, the lovely uh, musical interlude before we get started. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for Repeating Chesterfield Oscillations and Synthesizers, an online program by Cookie Brunel and facilitated by the New Gallery. We'd like to thank the Rosé Foundation for their support of this program. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land of Mokinstis, which TNG calls home, and Takaranto, the land which uh, Cookie Brunel currently resides. TNG gratefully acknowledges its homes on the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region, including the Blackfoot Confederacy, which consists of the Kainai, Pekani, and Siksika, the Métis Nation, Alberta Region 3, Stony Nakoda First Nation, Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley, and Susina First Nation. TNG would also like to acknowledge the many other First Nations, Métis, and Inuit who have crossed this land for generations. Takaranto is a traditional territory of many nations, including the Misagas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wednat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. We also acknowledge that Takaranto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Misagas of the Credit. We'd like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples across Turtle Island who have stewarded and protected this land for generations and continue to do so presently. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself. My name is Brittany Nickerson and I'm the programming coordinator at the New Gallery. The New Gallery is an artist run center located in Mokinstis and our vision is to provide opportunities and venues for artists that foster social and political art practices while engaging and educating audiences through artist run culture and contemporary art. Uh, today's program will be recorded for archival and documentation purposes, so please feel free to keep your camera off. Uh, we'll ask everyone that you please leave your mic muted during for the duration of this program. If you have any questions, uh, please put, feel free to just put them forward in the text chat, and Cookie will take uh, time after each kind of segment to answer those questions in the chat. Um, we're thrilled to welcome Cookie for today's program. They were a main space exhibitor with TNG in March 2020. Their exhibition, Every Worm Deserves a Mansion, used post-apocalyptic aesthetics and humor to address the power dynamics that sustain systemic discrimination and asked us to challenge our relationship to linearity and binaries. Okay, and with that, I will now pass it off to Cookie. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, hi everyone, uh, welcome to repeating Chesterfield. Uh, this is a beginner's workshop about electronic sound and synthesizers. Um, I think it should be about an hour, an hour and a half, depending how things go. And I've separated into three parts. 
Um, so, and like, as Brittany said, I've got a couple uh, sections for questions uh, that we can talk. And, um, oh, also I'll have some links uh, within the workshop that are gonna be posted in the chat. So you don't have to worry about um, writing them down fast or anything like that. And I am planning to also post this on my website in the next month once it's done. So if you want to rewatch or anything, you, could, you should be able to watch it there. Uh, okay, so let's get started. So part one is just called synthesizers. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to clear up any misunderstandings about like what even is a synthesizer in case people don't know. And I said, it's, this is aimed at beginners. So I just kind of want to get us all on the same page. Um, so you know what I'm talking about. And even if you're not a beginner, I feel like um, it's not always like super clear what a synthesizer is. Like, I feel like I never really defined it myself until last year, even though I've been playing them for a long time. <laughs> so anyway, um, okay, so a synthesizer, it's an electronic device that can generate and design sounds in real time. And um, this generation and design of sounds in real time is what's gonna be the significant difference, uh, what def what's defining a synthesizer. And a synthesizer is made of different electrical circuits designed to complete uh, specific functions that create these sounds. And today I'm going to be discussing some of the synthesizer circuits and their functions today. So you can learn about electronics, but also, um, you know, get going on synthesizers more where you're not just like button mashing or whatever, you kind of understand what you're doing. I'm kind of talking from my own experience of button mashing there. <laughs> Um, so the circuits and functions uh, and sounds can be triggered by different types of controllers. So um, the most, like the one probably people are the most familiar with is gonna be the keyboard. So a keyboard doesn't necessarily define the synthesizer because you can make and generate noises without a keyboard. That's just like a certain type of controller that allows you to uh, use a musical scale like with your fingers or whatever percussive uh, playing. And so you can use different kinds of controllers. Um, there's this one at the bottom I have here that's a ribbon controller. So that's going to be pressure sensitive. And as you move along it, that is going to trigger some sort of different function, whatever you set it to. And then other ones that uh, are often with a keyboard are these uh, wheel controllers. So that often does volume and pitch on a synthesizer that you buy or other kinds of keyboard. Um, there's light sensors. You can control a synthesizer with software like uh, Logic or GarageBand or whatever. And sequencers. Um, I'm not going to get into all the details of these things, but if you're familiar with that and MIDI, those are other ways that you can control it. And basically those can uh, make patterns of notes or, or something that you set it to where it's going to have this repeating pattern. Also like a drum machine uses a sequencer. And so what's the difference between a synthesizer and an electric piano? Um, so both can have keyboards, but the internal circuitry creates different types of sounds. So an electric piano, the sole purpose is to digitally replicate the sound of a piano. The piano keys trigger pre-recorded samples of sounds that cannot change. So this is where you're seeing this difference between the synthesizer. Uh, and I have a little note at the bottom that some synthesizers can use samples, uh, but I'm just, I'm not gonna get, I'm trying to make it a little bit of distinctions here for people to get going on understanding this. And then you'll find like, as you get deeper into synthesizers, there's, there's gonna be like exceptions to these, these rules. Um, and so if anyone wasn't clear about what a sample is, it's a, just a short recording. So uh, on an 88, key piano, it could include recordings of each key or even multiple recordings for each key played with varying degrees of pressure when the sustained pedals depress, things like that. So it's not live, it's all pre-recorded. Okay, so then I've separated uh, synthesizers into types also to understand this a little bit more because you see different forms of them a lot. Um, there's modular, normalized and hybrid. So for modular, that is gonna be this first one. Um, so somebody's made this 
big case. <laughs> and each one of these little squares within it is, is a function module. And they're gonna each have the different circuitry that's doing some sort of different function. And you can move them all around and you can also connect them in different ways using the patch cords, as you see. Um, and so that's why it's uh, called modulars because they can move. Um, and then, so the normalized synthesizer is going to be hardwired together. Those, it still has these, like function modules of sort, but they're inside and you can't change the order of them. So you can still change like the parameters and you still have a lot of options, but it's just, it's more limited than the modular. Um, but uh, other benefits are like they, could, they can be cheaper and easier to get going because people are familiar with, you know, keyboards and uh, you don't have to know as much electronics, I guess. I don't use modular synths yet, or I don't know, maybe I will one day, but so I won't get too far into those today, but oh, I also wanted to say that with a modular synth, you can still connect a keyboard or different types of controllers. So um, the difference essentially is gonna be like, is it soldered together, I guess. And then the last one is just a combination of the two. Okay, so that one's really short. <laughs> Does, that's just the intro kind of, did anybody have questions about that? I know it's kind of soon for questions, but just in case. What type of musicians use the modular synthesizer? Um, well, I mean, anyone can use it. So a lot of, I guess, noise musicians would use it because it can be more experimental um, and a little bit less melodic, but it doesn't, not necessarily. And I think there's also, uh, oh, I see it. Yes, yeah, someone's agreeing with me. <laughs> hey, and um, also, because it's it's kind of difficult to replicate like your results sometimes and also I'm kind of, I'm not talking from experience I'm talking from other people telling me because like I said I haven't used them <laughs> but from my understanding because it's like this live generation of sound it's it's a little bit difficult to replicate there are really um somebody that I really like who's a famous modular synthesis musician from like the 70s. And I don't wanna say her name wrong, but it's Suzanne Chiani, I think. Um, oh, maybe I'll just type it in the chat. Um, she more recently, I'm pretty sure that's how you spell it. If you, you'll probably find it if you Google if I spelled it wrong, but yeah, more recently she was doing like uh, new age music, but earlier on you can find her modular synth performances. And I think they're really cool. Um, I should have made a music playlist for this. <laughs> well, there's one. Okay. Um, does that answer your question? I hope. Um, they could definitely be used for like interesting soundtracks too. Okay, sweet. I will move on. So, um, part two, oscillations. So uh, to understand synthesizers, we need a basic understanding of some of the concepts from physics, including oscillations, waves, and waveforms. So an oscillation can be described as a constant back and forth pattern of motion. So familiar examples would be the swinging pendulum or a vibrating guitar string um, that has that repeating pattern. And a wave is an oscillation that transfers energy from one location to another location and then more specifically, mechanical waves transfer energy through matter, such as sound, which transfers energy through the air. And then air is going to be the example of matter. And we're going to be talking about those. So then uh, if that's a wave, like what's the difference between a wave and a waveform? So a waveform is not a physical wave or energy. It's a drawing created by plotting numbers on a graph. Um, so it's mathematical they represent the repeating change of something over time. So in this example of waveforms that I have on the side, we don't know what they're representing because they haven't been like defined. Um, but for an example of something that a waveform can represent, we have audio waveforms. As an audio waveform charts the vibrations of air particles over time. 
Um, so it doesn't say on this uh, diagram I have, but the up and down could be air particle or air pressure. And then the left and right would be signifying time. And um, when we look at um, these waveforms, we can learn like more about the phenomenon phenomenon by studying their characteristics. So you're probably familiar with the words like amplitude and frequency. These are important when understanding synthesizers. So I'm pointing these ones out specifically. Amplitude is uh, going up and down on the, the waveform chart. And then frequency is the number of oscillations per second. And I'm gonna explain, get more into that after. So then another example of a waveform is an electrical waveform. Um, in electronics, a waveform represents the shape of changing voltage or current over time. Um, so instead of air pressure, like in the last example, the y-axis is voltage and we still have time going left and right. Um, I'm not gonna get it into current because uh, it's not gonna be, I, I just wanna focus on voltage today because it's gonna be too much electronics information if I don't. <laughs> Um, so a simple definition for just our purposes today of voltage is that it's a force that drives electricity so that electrical circuits can function. And hopefully people know what an electrical circuit is. Um, it's like made of conductive material uh, joining different electrical components so that the electricity can flow through it and serve some sort of purpose. Um, so I have one example. Uh, just turning on a light, the voltage has to be a certain amount in order to turn on the light. And if it doesn't, if it's not high enough, the, the circuit won't function. Um, so for an example, with this uh, waveform that I have here, if we had just completely hypothetically a light that only turned on when it got to 400 volts, this waveform would show like a flickering light because um, as the change in voltage happens over time, it's going up and down. So the light wouldn't get enough voltage to be like consistent in my example. Okay. So oscillators, uh, these are how we generate the waveforms in a synth. Um, so you can say like oscillator circuit or oscillator is kind of interchangeable. That would be like the same thing. And these are like fundamental to making sound with a synthesizer. Um, and so kind of reiterating what I said before, oscillator circuits combine different electrical components that have their own different functions to create and output different waveforms. And these waveforms are also called electrical signals. So you might hear that said as well. And I've got a little picture here of just like a very simple oscillator circuit on a breadboard. Uh, all this one does is it's making an LED flash on and off. So you can't tell from the picture because it's frozen, but that little light would be going on and off. And um, the way that it does that is there's a, this capacitor is gonna be gradually letting in voltage up and down. And then the transistor has more of like an on off pattern of voltage. And when you combine them, they like, make a new waveform together. Um, and I will be showing that later. <laughs> so uh, four common waveforms that you're gonna see with synthesizers are gonna be sine wave, square wave, triangle wave, and sawtooth wave. So um, as I was saying with the different components, like generally you could think about a transistor doing this square wave on and off. Um, which is also used in binary code and computers. Uh, and then um, that the capacitor I was talking about should have more of like a triangle wave because it's gradually letting the voltage go up and then releasing it. So then there's this connection between the electrical waveform and the, the audio that's uh, coming out of the synthesizer. So they're really connected and that's what we're gonna talk about more also today. Um, so with a 
triangle wave again, for example, you can think about it as like visually connecting to the sound. So it's like going, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> and then the square wave is like more of like an on and off. So it's like, uh, 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 uh. And um, I have this link is a really good visual explanation or interactive explanation of uh, how the waveforms well, uh, I think about waveforms in general. Yeah, that's a good website for further explanation on this. Okay, so um, as an example on a synthesizer, this is a synthesizer that I have and I like to use. <laughs> um, the first thing you're going to do when you're shaping your sounds on your synth is like you're going to make that waveform basically or choose which like is your like fundamental waveform. So that is where your oscillator circuit comes in. Um, on my synth that I have an example of here, it's actually labeled oscillator one and oscillator two. And so then I can go down into the functions and I see uh, number 12 here. It's hard to see, but it says waveform and it's saying one to 16. So on this one, it actually shows me what those 16 waveforms look like um, in these little pictures. And uh, you can see number 16 is the sine wave that uh, I mentioned before. Um, and then this has, yeah, two oscillators and you can choose the different waveforms for each one and then combine them and then it makes an even more complex waveform. So a stranger sound. Um, and then that is known as voltage controlled oscillators. And there's a connection between, as I was showing with the electrical waveform and the audio waveform, when the voltage goes up and down, um, certain things about the sound are gonna also change. And I'm gonna demonstrate that in a minute. So um, like a lot of synthesizers might just say VCO on them and this oscillator one might it means the same thing, but yours might say something else. But I think generally they should pretty much all have a, something, either VCO or an oscillator. Someone else, can, if you if you have a different one, I we can talk about it in the chat after. <laughs> okay, so now what are these sound qualities that I'm talking about? Um, so when we have more voltage, um, that's going to make our sound louder and it also affects tone. So tone, you can think about like if anyone plays guitar and you have a tone knob, it's going to make it sound like more bassy or, or more trebly. So when the waveform is larger like that, it's letting more high frequency waveforms or frequencies through so that it sounds more trebly. And then when it has less voltage, it's going to sound more bassy and quieter. And then frequency, so that was amplitude. Frequency is gonna affect pitch. So this is how the note is determined. So um, more frequency, higher frequency is gonna just be a higher note. Um, and this is just like a picture kind of showing how a keyboard lays out the different voltages uh, to, uh, so that you know which note you're getting in your scale. And yeah, this is just what I already said. Okay. Then the last piece of the puzzle is like, how do the waveforms turn into sound in the air again, right? Because up until now, I was really more just talking about what's going on in the electronics. So the electrical signal is lastly sent through an amplifier circuit, um, you know, within your amp or speaker which increases the electrical signal so that it's strong enough to be converted to mechanical energy uh, through a speaker. Uh, so that the mechanical energy I'm talking about is that sound wave again in the air. So uh, just my little example. Oh, so when we're talking about synthesizers, it's, it's the oscillator that's um, like the starting point, but with a microphone, it would be your voice converted into another electrical signal instead of the oscillator. So the mic turns the voice vibrations into a weak electrical signal. This signal travels through the conductive wire to the amp, and then the amp has to increase the strength of the signal 
and then convert it back to vibration in the air by uh, I don't know actually how speakers work very well, but I know they move like this according to the waveforms to recreate the sound. Okay, um, so now I'm going to show you some examples. Let's see, I'll stop sharing my screen for a bit. And then can you put my camera on the main or I guess I'm probably already. I think that worked. Light. Nice. Spotlighted for everyone. So, okay. So, um, I've got three little examples. Hopefully, you can see. Um, this first one is just a very simple oscillator, single oscillator, just on a breadboard. So a breadboard is something good for prototyping circuits and it's like cheap and you don't have to know how to solder. You just can push through whole components uh, into the board and there's uh, conductive strips underneath that allow it connect. And then that's how you can design your circuits. Um, this one I've got hooked up to a, what's called an amplifier module. So I could connect it to a speaker or something like that, but this is just something you can buy like from an electronics place. You can also just make a little amp circuit if you want, but this comes like already pre-built and it's pretty affordable and just like kind of good for testing stuff out. And um, then that's connected to a little crappy speaker. And I've got a battery powering my amp module and my oscillator is connected to what's called a variable power supply. So this allows me to change the voltage and current to be different. So it's also good for testing stuff. Um, okay, I think I'll just turn it on. I can't remember this one, I think needs about, oh, I already had it. So I think this one is 12 to 18 volts. It's really simple. I hope you can all hear that annoying sound. <laughs> um, that's an oscillation. And it also can be seen with this little flashing light. Uh, I'm gonna turn it down a little bit on the amp module. So I can just talk over it. Um, but other things uh, that are notable in the circuit that I haven't talked about yet is a um, potentiometer. So these are like knobs on speakers, basically. And what they do is they increase or uh, decrease resistance in the circuit. And that is going to increase or decrease the voltage. So this is getting back to this idea of a voltage controlled oscillator. When I have more or less voltage in the circuit, it does different, makes different sounds. So as I turn it down, you're gonna see that the frequency decreases. So that's uh, the highest frequency it can do. And even if I uh, increase voltage on here, it's gonna do the same thing too. So that's my VCO. Um, and on a synthesizer, it's not going to be called when, okay, so this amp module also has another type of potentiometer right here that's changing the voltage. And so that's the part that's controlling the volume. And on a synthesizer, that's called VCA, voltage controlled amplifier. <laughs> that was a little more straightforward. It's kind of just volume. All right, so I think that's it for this one that I want to talk about. Um, I'm going to post a shopping list for this project because this is the easiest oscillator uh, project that I could find online. So I'll put it on my website for people who want to get started with that. It's kind of difficult to buy. I, or like when I was starting electronics, I found it, like shopping for stuff was the most intimidating for some reason. Um, but so I kind of have some 
leads on that and on my website for this one, but there's also going to be some other links in the chat today of uh, simple projects that you can get as a kit. So then they send you all of the components and you don't really have to worry about the shopping part. I'll show you those at the end. Okay, so I'm going to unplug all this stuff because I need to reuse the cords. Okay, so that was one oscillator. And this one I designed by mm, evolving that circuit in, <laughs> just to have three oscillators that can go at the same time. And it also has an on off switch that just turns one of the oscillators on and off. And it also has a tone knob. So uh, remember when I was talking about amplitude and frequencies, high and low frequencies earlier affecting tone, um, this tone knob is going to change the bass or the treble. Um, and that's also a, one of the fundamental functions of a synthesizer called uh, VCF. So that one's called voltage controlled filter. And yeah, it's called a filter because it's filtering out certain wavelengths. So the, either the high or the low pass. So my synth has a low pass filter um, and that's because when I engage it, it's um, uh, letting the low frequencies pass basically. All right, uh, I'm using my alarm clock because I have too short of a cord on this. And don't worry, I don't use an alarm clock to wake up. I use my phone. <laughs> okay. Um, who, for people who understand, I'm just connecting the positive and the negative. I'm not gonna get into that too much. And um, I think this one uses the same voltage. So. so you should hopefully be able to hear that it has, right now it should have, two, yeah, <laughs> has two oscillators going right now. Um, maybe if I turn this light off. Well, there's a little light here. So you can get a little bit more complicated sounds. Um, and then up here is my tone knob. So you can hear what I was talking about. You should hear it get more bassy. Oh, it already was on. There we go. So yeah, that's cutting the amplitude and there's less high frequencies. Now the high frequencies are there. Okay, that's that one. <laughs> and uh, after these, I'm gonna show you the waveforms visually with an oscilloscope. Okay, and the last one is I didn't, or I didn't design this, I just um, bought a kit. Uh, so this is an example of something when you get a little bit further into making electronics, you can again, like get sent all the parts and instructions and you just solder it all together and you can make a more complex synth. Um, and yeah, it's from this company that's popular called Music From Outer Space. I also will have a link for that. Um, this one, I'm just using a car cable into a, a, like a guitar amp under my table, but I don't bring it up. Okay. Touching it again to the variable power supply. And I haven't, okay, I made all this stuff and then I didn't really play them that much. So I still, I'm not like good at controlling this, but I'm just gonna give you a little taste. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
My uh, cable's bad. Okay, well, that's annoying. The cable was working this morning, but you get the idea. <laughs> it just makes uh, lots of variety of more sounds because there's more oscillators and more functions in this one. Okay, um, now I'm going to go back to my screen share. Um, so this is a video that will let you visualize what I was just doing um, on the first breadboard oscillator. This one has the same circuit that I showed you plus the tone knob. Um, and uh, I had to make a video because I don't own an os oscilloscope because they're pretty expensive. But um, here it is. So uh, it's kind of like a sawtooth looking waveform. Goes up abruptly and then down gradually. Kind of dirty. <laughs> and what I understand that's from combining the transistor and capacitor. This is the tone knob. You see the amplitude is getting smaller. And back up. And that's the frequency changing with the potentiometer changing the voltage. Um, and then this is just changing the view on the oscilloscope. You can zoom in and out and move it up and down. And you can record your waveforms if you want to on a USB. <laughs> um, so yeah, basically it's it's showing you the electrical waveform. Which is fun to visualize with the sound, I think. It helps people learn. More frequency changing the pitch, and that's it. Um, okay, question round two. This is the last question round because after that, I'm doing something else. <laughs> I'm going to pull up the chat. Um, okay. Okay. Bookstore has some supplies. Nice. Um, DigiKey. Yep, I ordered from DigiKey a lot. Um, sorry, if it, I'm just saying the things from the chat. Someone said that um, they used to order from DigiKey.ca, and yeah, I, I use that one too. That's just kind of be a little tricky when you're getting started because you some things you got to buy in bulk. Like you can't just buy one resistor, you know, I don't think. <laughs> um, safe soldering at home. Uh, I have, so I have a fume extractor. Mm. I'm afraid if I take it out right now, it's gonna knock over everything on my desk. <laughs> but you probably use those at school too. It's like a fan to suck out um, the smoke when you're soldering. Uh, I guess the other safety thing would be using lead-free solder, even though it's more annoying. And you can get uh, grounding bracelets, but I haven't 
needed that unless you're using AC, which I don't think you should really be doing as a beginner. Like you should start with DC or batteries. Um, you can get static mats. That's more for like the safety of your components so they don't get damaged. Um, what else for soldering? I guess obviously don't touch it. It's hot. <laughs> um, maybe uh, if I if you have more questions on that, you can write it in the chat. So I'll look at the next one. Oh, okay. Proper ventilation, not burn yourself. Yep. <laughs> um, ventilation, fume extractor. Service. Cool. Oh yeah, safety glasses, That I should have remembered that. I do find sometimes a little bit of solder might actually like pop at me. So I do think it's good to wear safety glasses. <laughs> Welding goggles. <laughs> okay, um, so I think that's it for the questions. I'm gonna go to the, um, part three, I guess. Okay, so for part three, I wanna finish the workshop by going back to the start, uh, to the hypothetical time-shifting waiting room that we were in earlier. So in addition to music, a waiting room might also have reading material to pass the time. Um, and in this waiting room, you pushed over some old magazines and found a book called An Individual Note of Music, Sound and Electronics by Daphne Orm, 1972. You flip over the book and on the back you read that Daphne Orm was an early electronic musician and innovator. She created the Oramix machine in 1957, which was an electronic device that converts drawings into electronic sounds. Um, you're waiting for what must be a while because you get to chapter two and three where Orem describes that uh, cells inside of the human body oscillate like electronics, but at frequencies that we can't hear. She theorizes that these frequencies interact with infinite oscillations in our environments to distort and create particular and personal realities. Um, so you start to wonder, what other oscillations exist around us that we can't sense or haven't noticed? Can we change this particular reality by acknowledging new oscillations? So um, we talked about electrical and mechanical oscillations, but I haven't mentioned visual oscillations yet, or I kind of touched on it, but we haven't defined them. So we know a drawn waveform is a visual representation of change. It's abstract, meaning it relies on additional information like voltage or air pressure, as we mentioned, uh, in order to give it meaning. So it doesn't repeat through time, um, but it does have a repetitive visual pattern in the second dimension. So a generic waveform is symbolic and thus subject to interpretation. Uh, visual repetition can create a sense of measure or time like counting, a drumbeat, a heart pulsating. Uh, repetition and cycles can suggest sustained force or movement, uh, such as with voltage and electrical circuits or waves in water. So basically what I'm saying here is that it can reference the third dimension if you're familiar with it. And then repetition is also a type of contrast in sound and in visual patterns, more contrast can be described as louder. And a keychain, a, a carabiner, makes a square wave if we measure the on off of the key rings. And according to Gestalt psychology and design, elements that are similar are perceived to be more related than elements that are dissimilar. So visual oscillation can create a whole or a new whole out of separate parts. Um, so then if there are visual oscillations, are there visual synthesizers? And I don't mean a video synthesizer. So I know those exist. <laughs> um, I don't have an answer for this question right now, but I have a story. 
Um, in uh, 1995, I got a job in a new city where I didn't know anyone. A couple of months after I moved there, I came home on my lunch break and the door was locked and there was eviction notice on it. My roommate had been keeping the rent instead of paying it. So I went to the nearest YMCA and I booked a room for a month. On my way to my new room, I came across another tenant from behind. I thought she was a young backpacker, uh, but when she turned around, her face looked about 70 years old. She told me to follow her to find the good water. Uh, and then after following her through three floors without finding it yet, I just decided to hang back and go to my room instead. When I got to my room, somebody uh, next door to me was talking really loudly on the phone. And then the next morning I was woken up by the old faced lady telling someone next to her, or sorry, telling someone new to follow her to the good water. I waited for them to pass and then went to the shared bathroom at the end of the hall. I took a shower and I left for work. When I came back from work, there was a new security guard at the front desk. The first, uh, sorry, at first the guard mistook me for a visitor. Uh, no visitors were allowed to enter the rooms. So I showed the guard my room key and headed upstairs where I could hear my neighbor's voice all the way down the hall. As I got closer to the neighbor's door, I noticed it was half op open and no person was inside. Instead, a wormy looking machine was emitting the loud voice. I stepped a little closer to shut the door and the voice got higher in pitch. I couldn't help myself and I stepped a little closer. The voice kept raising until I finally picked up the thing and it was like the voice inverted. And then a second later, I heard the water lady come through the hallway. I didn't want to be caught visiting. I panicked and I ran back to my room, still holding the entanglement. I looked at the thing, trying to turn the volume down as it was basically screaming still and the buttons didn't do anything. So I tried to muffle the sound by tightly hugging it. The pitch increased again this time so high it became inaudible. The water lady passed by my door talking the same as any other day. Uh, I sat still for a few minutes, imagining what to do with this screaming spaghetti that I'm consoling. I decided to ditch it at the lost and found at the front desk. Uh, and luckily the security guard wasn't there. As soon as I placed the machine down, it started to squeal again. And the only way I knew how to make it quieter was to move far away. So that's the end. <laughs> Thanks for coming. I have uh, one more little segment here with um, free learning resources. So um, there's this video on YouTube that I liked. It's really old, but I thought it was really informative uh, and good for getting started with synthesizers and and also talk more about all these things that I told you about VCO, VCO, VCF, VCA, VCF. Um, and I thought it could be a good like self-learning thing if you were to watch this and then um, you can actually just go online and use a synth emulator even if you don't have a physical synth or software or anything. These are free. Um, this is an example of an old analog synth uh, Juno 106. And then there's a lot more examples at the top website, Playtronica. And for the people interested in modular synths, this is a free online modular synth emulator. Actually, uh, I think you download the software, I can't remember. Uh, okay, I'll just check the chat since I'm... So what's going on? Oh, it's the links, cool. Um, so, and then these are the beginner's kits that I was mentioning a little while ago. Um, so you can make a simple oscillator like I was showing you. These are slightly, you know, different ones. They have little chips and stuff, but they're easy to make and you can get a kit. Um, the first one's a theremin. So I believe that one is going to be light sensor. So you control it like by moving your hand or whatever. And it makes oscillations. Um, and then this is just that company that I showed you with the one that I made and they have a lot more um, kits and much more complex synthesizers too. And they have like books and everything. It's, it's very eccentric. <laughs>
And uh, I also, I haven't done one of these yet, but I used to want to do this when I played guitar more. You can get guitar pedal kits and I think they would be a little bit easier or quite a bit easier than the music from outer space kits and probably good good soldering practice and you wouldn't like waste as much money if you mess it up in time. <laughs> and then you get like kind of a function module anyway, cause you could probably attach some of these to other instruments too, not just guitars. Uh, okay, yeah, and then this is if you, if you wanna follow any more of what I'm doing, that's my Instagram and my new website, uh, which is coming up to be or which will be updated soon, <laughs> but is still functioning. I'm just excited to show you the finished updates because I think it looks cool. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Cookie. That was amazing. Um, and with that, um, uh, yeah, there's no more questions. So that concludes the workshop for today. Thank you um, everyone for joining us. Um, the links are in the chat. So um, if you'd like those, you can uh, copy paste them. If you um, have any feedback for us or uh, need those links, you can always uh, email me. It's uh, Brittany at the new All right. Uh, oh yeah, or you can click uh, and save the chat. Okay, thanks, Sue. Uh, all right, thank you, everyone, um, and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Bye.